Well, it was my sister's graduation, and uh, I was in seventh grade. My sister's about five years older than me. So all the family comes up, and we lived in a town in Iowa called Charles City, and we had a, the Cedar River runs right through town. So it was, I don't know, it was one of those days in the weekend before the graduation, and my two cousins came, one of which is I go to Canada with every year, um, but, but my two cousins come, and they're a little bit older than my sister, so they were probably 20 and 22 years old, 23 years old. They came and they said, why don't we go rent a canoe and canoe on the river? So I was down, so we go, although I got stuck just sitting kind of in the middle while they rode around, you know, canoed around the, the river. So we're on this canoe. It's an aluminum kind of junky old canoe that we rented from a gas station or somewhere. And they're canoeing around. And the thing about this, this river was right near our church, as the river went by, there was a dam. And it was a concrete, I mean, waterfall kind of dam. And normally it was probably five feet or so of a drop. It was not that big of a deal. But it was a particularly high year, a uh, high rain year. We, the water had risen quite a bit. Um, it was 1994, and so 93 were the crazy flooding floods, but 94 we had a lot of rain as well. So it was a bit more of a, of a dam, of a waterfall. So I'm in there in the canoe, and my cousins decide they had this great idea. We're just going to row up to the edge of the waterfall and then just look and then we'll come back. I'm like, no, this is not a good idea. <laughs> and they said, no, we're fine. They're, you know, they thought we're we're big and strong guys. We we can we can do it. We'll run up there. The current doesn't look that bad. We'll go up to the edge. We'll look over. We'll see kind of what's going on, and then we'll row away. Well, thankfully, there's this cable that would run from shore to shore in case somebody got in trouble. And so maybe 10, 15 feet. From the dam is this cable going by, and as they're, I have no control, I have no oar. As they're rowing towards the thing, I grab the cable, and I hold on for dear life. They get mad at me because we end up sitting at this cable for quite a while. And they keep trying to convince me, it's going to be fine, let's just go to the edge, we'll come back, it's not that big of a deal. I'm like, no, we're going to die. This is not happening. They're like, come on, you know, it's calling me a, a wimp, whatever else. I'm like, I am not letting go of this cable. Cars are stopping on the overpass, you know, on the, on the bridge, wondering what the heck is going on with these idiots out there holding on to the cable. Finally, I convinced them, take me to the side, then do whatever you want. I don't care what you do after that, but I'm going back. So finally I convinced them. I let go of the cable. They, they, we start rowing over to the, to the shore so that they could let me off and do what they wanted to do. My dad happened to be driving by on the bridge when we were sitting there holding the cable, saw us, and tore off down to that that spot ashore. And thankfully, as they were letting me off, my dad pulled up, ran down there and said, what are you guys doing? And they told him their plan, and he said, no way in the world are you doing that. You have no idea how big that is. So they're like, okay, and they get out, we pull the canoe up, and we get up and we walk over to on the shore to where the dam is, and it was probably 12 feet uh, of a drop uh, moving very quickly. I still take credit for them being alive today. They still tell me I'm a wimp. It was a scary moment to think about the things that we were dealing with. High water and a junky boat. I mean, an aluminum canoe. The, you know what canoes are like. They don't like to stay up anyway. And they were ready to take it off. I can't imagine being in harsher seas and higher waters than something like that. Well, we're continuing to retell stories. We... we uh, we're looking at those stories that, that maybe we learned when we were kids or we heard about or we see it, uh, see in the, the culture around us and, and going back to kind of re-experience them, especially as adults to, to, uh, to learn what it is that God has for us. Last week we retold the story of Adam and Eve. You know, this, this idea that, 
that God made two people in this beautiful garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil was there. And You know, it's so, so crazy to think that up until they disobeyed, God had decided, had determined what was good in their life. And once they disobeyed, that changed completely. Now we try to define our own good and evil instead of listening to God's definition. And it led to bad things. We're going to continue to see that as we as we look at a new story today. But as we look at Genesis, the book of Genesis is broken into two parts, and we see all these stories in both parts. The first part is God creating uh, his the world and the story of the fallenness of humanity. So we see God create the world, engage with Adam and Eve, and then what happens when they disobey. Now the second part is an introduction to God's way of redemption. The first part of Genesis shows us how the world got broken. The second part shows us how God is going to redeem through Abraham and Israel. But today we're going to go back to that cute little story of an old man with a bunch of animals on a boat, Noah and the flood. We always tell it that way. It's usually We usually see pictures in the the boat looks like a little bathtub looking thing and there's all these animals crammed down to it and there's like giraffe heads sticking out the windows and you know Noah's an old guy and and it's always this kind of interesting looking picture. I remember we had toys, you know, that were Noah's ark that had a kind of big ark, but when you look at it like four people could fit on this little boat and like six animals, like no way. But it's a story about how God is going to destroy the earth with a flood. He's going to destroy all of of humanity except for this one guy and his family. It rains for 40 days and 40 nights. They spend all this time on this boat. And most of our study, I mean, we tell the story to kids and we look at it kind of as as that moral lesson. Uh, God has chosen someone who is good and this person, Noah, is faithful and God is faithful to him and he saves him from the waters. And out of him, God creates the rest of the world, humanity. In the church, most of the time, when we look at this story, uh, we we start asking questions like, did this really happen? Is this a parable or is this a real thing that happened in history? We ask questions like, okay, so was this a worldwide, like did the whole world go underwater or was it a local flood that kind of was the, the world as they knew it? We ask the questions about, you know, how did the animals fit, especially when we picture a little kind of bathtub-looking boat. If all the animals in the world, two by two, came, how did they fit? And most importantly, did did unicorns just not make it at the right time, and they missed the cast-off? We ask those questions because it's tough to understand. Where did all this water come from? How did this happen? How big of a boat could this have been? How, how would Noah have known how to build a boat, and where did he find all the animals? I mean, all these kind of details. And, and what we've learned about Hebrew writing is that they leave out a bunch of that stuff on purpose. They do that because we're intended to read it and meditate on it, to ask those questions, to wonder what's going on, to wonder what, what they're trying to say. And you know, if all those details are in there, you can read the story once, know everything that happened, and never go back and read it again but it's intended to be a part of our meditation as a follower of God, to go back and to to search the Scriptures for those answers. Today we're going to look at it. And what we're wondering today was, what was the writer who was inspired by God? What was the writer telling us in this story? And what does this story have to do with our story? And ultimately God's story in the world. So let's start by doing this. Look at the world in the time of Noah, the setting of our story. This is after the garden, but still early in history. We know that after Adam and Eve were banished from the garden, things started getting bad quickly. The next thing we see is their two sons, Cain and Abel. You may know that story. They go out into the field uh, because Cain is jealous of Abel. God seems to favor Abel's sacrifices, his gifts, better than Then Cain's, they go out to a field and Cain kills his brother. The first murder we see in in history. And he kills him and God recognizes it and punishes Cain, not by death, but by casting him away. 
Not long after that, we see violence getting worse and worse. We hear about this man named Lamech. And Lamech is this guy that brags about being way worse than Cain. He says, I've killed way more people than Cain. He, he um, acquired wives like property. He was an awful person. We hear just a little bit about him, but it isn't good. And, and over the course of reading what's happening in Genesis, we see the world is spiraling downward. It took one act of disobedience to begin, and now we're spiraling out of control. It brings us to the world of Noah in Genesis chapter 6. This is what it says. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. I'm going to read that one more time. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. God had made these people this great plan. They're going to live together. They're going to experience my love. They're going to represent me as image bearers. They're going to love one another and love me. And we're going to have this great community of love based on the community that is God himself. And then Adam and Eve messed up. and They disobeyed. They wanted to know. They wanted to choose for themselves what was right and wrong instead of letting God choose. And then people just little by little, kept making these choices that moved him further away. And after a while, God looked at his creation and, and it doesn't say he was angry, it says he was grieved. He was sad. I've made these, these people like me and yet they choose sin. The story I always thought of is about God's anger. God got angry with humanity, so he wiped it out. But the reality is, it's out of God's sadness and ultimately his mercy that this story comes about. It says in verse 7, So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I've created, people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I've made them. But Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. He looks down at his creation and is sorry that he made them, but he sees Noah, and he sees this one person that seems to get it. Maybe there's still a chance. I love this aspect of the story because it reminds us that we have a God who is always looking for, maybe there's still a chance. And when I see people around in my life that, that I don't think have a chance of redemption, you know those people that you're like, yeah, that guy's never going to get it. I had a guy like this in high school. He's now a pastor in Michigan. Because God is always searching for that chance to do something good. He does that with Noah. He grieves for his creation, but Noah found favor in his sight. Let's look at Noah and his family. Genesis 6, starting in verse 9. These are the descendants of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw that the earth was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. And God said to Noah, I've determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I'm going to destroy them along with the earth. Make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you're to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its width, 50 cubits. And its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and put the door of the ark on its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For my part, I'm going to bring a flood of waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. 
So God chooses this one family. He, he sees some righteousness here. And the rest of the world is violent and evil. And, and to protect what is good, he has this plan. Noah would be saved and his family with him. And from them, God would redeem his creation. Now, it's important to note, some of the wording in here makes us think sometimes that Noah was perfect. He wasn't. He was, he was a normal person. He wasn't perfect, but he was good. He was upright in his generation, it says. Good compared to those around him. So God brings the water. Such a fascinating thing. I mean, again, it brings up all these questions, for me at least, and it might for you too, like where did all the water come from? How did, how did that happen? You know, did it actually cover the world? Are all the documentaries real? Have they actually found it in Turkey somewhere in the mountains and they just can't quite get to it? Because I saw those documentaries everywhere. All the other questions about this flood. This huge boat that, based on what we know about a cubit, means it was probably a football field and a half long, almost a football field wide and high. I mean, big ship. This flood wipes away all the evil in the world. Kind of. See, here's the problem. So God has this great idea. I've got one good guy and one good family. I'm going to save the world through him, and then we're going to start over, and everything's going to go better. But the problem is that one family that God saved still has the stain of sin within them, right? I mean, we've got some good people in this room right now. But if God chose any one of us, we've still got problems uh, when we're through the flood and starting over. Because our disobedience, our desire for self, our sinfulness continues, even if we're pretty darn good people. It's still there. Water recedes and God makes a covenant, a promise, as I was telling the kids. He makes a promise to them to, to be with them. It says this in, in chapter 8, verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing odor, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of humankind. For the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth, nor will I ever again destroy every living creature as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. God recognizes in his covenant that evil lurks in the humanity that he's created. But even so, he's not going to do this again. He makes this promise. He says, God, it says, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you shall rest on every animal of the earth and on every bird of the air and everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hands they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And just as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. He goes on to tell them that, that uh, they are going to be his people. He says, as for me, I'm establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many came out of the ark. Establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all generations. I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It's a great story. And I love the happily ever after we tell it to kids you know, Noah comes out with his family. They start to repopulate the earth. God sets a rainbow in the sky and says, this is my promise. I'm never going to do this again. This is all well and good. It's a great way to end the story. If only that was the end of the story. You know, so often we tell these stories to kids and we, know we don't include all of it. Sometimes that's understandable. This one we see a glimpse of the sin of man right away if we look at one more thing in this story, what I call the incident in Genesis 9. It says that Noah becomes a farmer. The guy was a construction worker. He built a boat. 
became a sailor. He, he you know, ran the boat and lived on it for a while. Now he's going to be a farmer. And he goes out and, he's, and of course, the first thing he plants is a vineyard. And we don't know much. This is the first time we've ever seen anything about planting a vineyard and having wine. We don't know what he knew and what he didn't know, but what we, what the Bible says is he immediately gets drunk and falls asleep naked in his tent. This is not his best moment. This is a reminder that even Noah, who was righteous before God, who, who God chose to save, is still a bit of a dumbo like the rest of us. You know, still makes some decisions that he shouldn't make. He gets drunk. He, he ends up naked in his tent. It is unbecoming of a man of his stature. This incident happens, and we don't, we don't really know exactly what happens. But we know that it's less about Noah, really, and more about his sons. See, he has these three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and they're the ones that are going to repopulate the earth. And his three sons are there, and they've, they have, uh, they've begun to live on this ground, and sin finds its way into their situation. So Noah is passed out drunk in his tent. His son, Ham, comes in, sees him, and instead of doing what he should have done, which is trying to help protect the, the uh, integrity of his father and covering him up, he instead went out and chose the, the gossip route. Instead of doing what he should have done to to care for his father, he goes out and broadcasts to his brothers what his dad has done. So his brothers, they go into the, into the tent, they shield their eyes, they grab his cloak, and they cover him up and leave so that they don't cause him shame. One son, Ham, represents Cain, represents Lamech, represents the evil in the world, the one who who doesn't seem to know the right thing to do, and because of it, he's cursed. Noah curses Ham and his son, especially Canaan. If you recognize the name Canaan, it's because from him come the Canaanites, who God's people will have to expel from the promised land, who they'll be at war with all the time. The Canaanites who, who will be a people who are known by their evil deeds, by by child sacrifice, by all these things that God wants His people to have nothing to do with the sons of Ham. He represents a people of sin. At the same time, his two brothers do what is right. They protect Noah's modesty by covering him up without looking at him. And Noah blesses Shem and Japheth. And out of them, really out of Shem, comes eventually Abram, who is called to be Abraham, to be the future of God's redemption. So as we look at the world so far, God created good and Adam and Eve disobeyed. Sin spiraled throughout God's creation and God was so upset by it, he, he started over with Noah and his family. But sin lingered beyond the flood in Ham's sons. God hasn't given up though not on his creation. Even though all this has happened, he promises not to destroy like this again, and yet sin will spiral again. It's kind of depressing when you see this last piece of the story. Because after all this, there's still such a mess. And, and there's still this sinfulness that's continuing on and on for generations. But God has a plan. Remember I told you the first half is about creation and it's spiraling out of control. The second half of the book of Genesis is about this guy that God chooses to be the beginning of our redemption. No matter how horrible things seem to get, God is always seeking redemption. Sometimes there are terrible consequences to, to our sin, but God has not given up. And still today, he has a plan, and, and through his son Jesus, he offers redemption in the midst of our worst circumstances. So this isn't, this isn't necessarily a, a story that you can just book in and say, look, happily ever after, Noah was saved from the flood. And it's not a story that if you look at that last piece, you go, oh man, not again. 
We're messing up again. It's a story that says, look at our God who loves his creation so much that he just keeps coming. He just keeps trying to redeem. And we know today that it was finished when his son conquered death.